Good evening, everyone. Give you guys a chance to jump in here, give you just another 30 seconds or so. How's that sound, Cara Jean? I have Cara Jean help me out this evening. Good to see little Cara. Uh, it's, it's fun to recruit people from down and around, downstairs around the house to help me read the verses tonight. I don't always want to do it, but when I can find somebody, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. This is behind the scenes, so if you want to wave or say hi, he'll make sure and let us know who's on tonight. And if you have comments or questions along the way, um, just, let, just put them out there and he'll make sure that he gets there. Slides large, we'll keep it started in just a moment or two. And Car has agreed to step in and read the scriptures for us this evening. So, you guys, want to give a shout out to Miss Car Jean here? Say hi, let you know that you see her. She says hi to everyone. Then we're going to get started. We are in the Gospel of Matthew study tonight. This is part three. This is actually chapter number two. We'll always be a chapter or so behind as we go through this, at least a chapter behind. We're never going to catch up as far as syncing the number of studies and the number of chapters uh, because the first was introduction, and then we'll take uh, several parts for the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and so it's going to put us behind a chapter or two as we go through this. So just because we're in a certain part number does not mean we're in a certain chapter number. But tonight we're in part three. Chapter number two. A couple of comments from the last time we broadcast uh, on Facebook Live. Some folks made comments that they couldn't hear it. I assure you that uh, we're speaking as loud as we can on our side of things. We'll try to almost shout to make sure that you you can hear us. Adjust the volume on your uh, phone or your device that you're listening in on tonight because it may be on your end. I know Trish and I have ordered a microphone to get rid of some of the background noises so that the microphone will be across the room, but it'll be right here with us. So hopefully by next Wednesday night, if not this Sunday, we should have a microphone to be able to uh, broadcast uh, the sound from right here in our faces, which would be kind of cool, won't it? So that'll be nice to have take some of that out. We're really trying to improve this as we go through week by week. We appreciate you guys' patience. If you have any comments or uh, concerns you have, just let us know. We try to improve this every week so your experience at home uh, is as good as possibly can be. If you're going to copy the Gospel of Matthew study, go to Pleasant View Baptist Church's Facebook account, uh, Facebook page, and you can find, and the link's attached, you can find that, you can download and print that. So um, just find, feel free, if you can't get it that way, you can text me, you can email me, the information is on the screen here, I'll be glad to get this out to you. If you don't have access to either a printer, uh, let me know, I'll be glad to drop it off to your home if you live here close by. So without... Without delay, Matthew chapter 2, it is 6.05. We're going to get started right now. Car Jean. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Ju Judah, Judea. Judea, in the days of Her Herod, Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem to say, yes. Where is he who has been been born of king of the Jews. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Very good. Thank you, Miss Carjean. I hope, hope you guys at home were able to hear that. It was a little bit louder, but she did a great job reading that. This is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Um, the wise men noticed this. They have come into town. They've been following the star. We don't know how long. Uh, weeks at least the distance from Persia, where they probably were, to uh, the riding on camels, uh, at least a few weeks to get uh, get from Persia to uh, Jerusalem. The first stop in the town, they asked the uh, presiding king, King Herod, uh, about the star they saw because they know the star is a, a prophetic fulfillment uh, of uh, the star of the Messiah. So the wise men call Jesus a king, and they're addressing Herod, who holds the office of king. Now, Herod, we'll look at his character in a moment or two, who he, who he was historically, the person of Herod the Great. And um, he has the office of king. Uh, he's positioned, uh, he petitioned Rome, and they gave him the position of being king. And they, with that came political favors, and uh, he maintained some authority and rule of power in, in, as being king of the Jews. But 
I mean, the Romans, it's under their empire. They're calling the shots. He has the title of king, but the wise men come looking for the one who's the real king. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Very good. And I want you to notice as we go through the Gospels um, that worship is reserved for God alone. We know that to be true. Only God is worthy of worship. You don't worship angels. You don't worship ancestors. You don't worship carved images. You don't worship idols. You don't worship anything in creation. You worship what is outside of creation. You worship God. And worship is reserved for God alone. And they say, we were come, we've come looking for the king, and we want to worship him. Now, if you read the Gospels, you might be surprised to find that on many occasions, if not most of the time, Jesus will deflect worship from himself to God the Father. He will, he will, praise, he will direct praise to God the Father. There's a couple of occasions where he lets, that, he lets the disciples give him praise and worship uh, without deflecting that. One of those we saw last Sunday night was when, when Thomas said, My Lord and my God in the upper room the week after Easter. Uh, but here he's a baby, and he's not in the conversation, and the, and the wise men have come to worship Jesus, and they say, where's, where's this king? We've come to worship him. Now, it's right and necessary to worship God. So now the first question out of the gates, if you guys have been looking ahead, the first question is this. What did the wise men come to do? Any comments there, Tristan? He says, nope. Anybody waving or thumbs up? Nope. Well, Carl, I'm going to ask you the question. What did the wise men come to do? Um, worship him. Well, very good. That's the correct answer. So if you at home were thinking anything besides worship him, you had the wrong answer because they came to worship Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to worship him. Come on, Jimmy. I said worship him. She got the correct answer. She said worship. <laughs> okay, let's take, let's take a look at the story here. This is not the true nativity story, not the true birth of Christ story because... We'll see in a moment or two, Christ has already been born, and this is uh, not, a, not the earliest moments of the, of the birth of Christ. Luke has that story. This is the Gospel of Matthew version, which takes place sometime after the birth story. So, the star. Let's take a focus, focus on the star of this, uh, of this story here. There's a few proposed ideas what the star may have been. Some folks think it was a naturally occurring uh, celestial event, like a comet or a certain star in the sky they were following, or a meteorite, perhaps. Uh, I think most, um, most, uh, so most scholars who look at this in a truly natural way think that this was uh, the alignment of certain planets. And if you ever go to uh, um, a planetarium to see a Christmas show and see the stars in the night sky, they'll often show you alignments of certain planets and say, hey, this is how the sky looked. Uh, in that part of the world, that, that time of the birth of Christ, they're estimating how it would have looked then. He said these stars, the planets were aligned and they gave the appearance of, of where it would have settled. And so most folks, some folk, folks think it was a planetary alignment. Or another proposed idea, it wasn't a star, but it was an angel. Now, the word angel means messenger. And so this star could have been God's messenger, could have been just an angel. Or maybe, and this is maybe where I'm leaning to as I look at this, a supernatural thing. It was something created by God, uh, a light that they would have followed in the night. Uh, we know that God, there's precedence for this in the scriptures. The ancient Israelites followed a pillar of cloud uh, uh, the day uh, to keep them sheltered from the heat, and then a and then fire at night, right, in the sky. So it was a, a pillar of cloud at day and a pillar of fire at night in the wilderness. So this may have been a supernatural created event just uh, just for this one one moment, the, the birth of Christ that God made, had them follow, and then of course uh, it did it ceased to exist after they arrived at the, their destination. Well, if you look at the text here, the word aster is used, which means star, and it doesn't. It's not the word used for planet commonly. And Jude will use the same word in his epistle, Jude one thirteen. We use this word to describe a comet. So there's some range of what it could have been, a comet maybe something like that. But anyway. And we don't know for sure. Whatever it was, the wise men, these astrologers, were looking for it, and they knew it belonged to the, the newborn baby king, right? And who was also a God come in the flesh. All right. When Herod, Herod, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Very good. When you said Herod, I thought maybe you were talking about the angels at first. You know, Herald the angels sing, but I'm just teasing you. Cheesy dad joke. Herod. Herod is king. 
and Herod is troubled, and not just Herod, but all of his court officials, and most folks in Jerusalem are also uh, troubled with him. Now remember, this is my commentary, so if you can read that on the screen, the title given, remember the title given to Jesus by the wise men? It was the word, it was the title of king. And we'll look at Herod in a moment, or two. I promise we'll get to this in a little bit here. Herod, if you didn't know this historically, had three of his sons murdered because they were threats to his throne. So typically the oldest born male would be, have first line to the throne. And Herod had literally had three of his sons killed to keep them from getting, from getting the throne. So what do you think he would do to this, this Jewish, this little Hebrew baby, right? Uh, there would be no, uh, no reservations about killing a little Jewish baby if, they thought, if he thought this kid was going to be a threat to his throne. Kind of reminds you of the story of the Egyptians, how the Pharaoh had all the Egyptian little boys killed, right? Or the, or the babies killed. Yeah, it's a different, different story, different time. Too much uh, killing. And a lot of murder. This, this, these stories are very brutal. This would be a, an R-rated story if it was shown in all the details, for sure. The Bible doesn't. Clean, the Bible's not PG by any means. Any comments, Kristen? <laughs> no. If you didn't, just kind of let us know that. And so some folks in Jerusalem, believe it or not, uh, thought that Herod deserved the right to have the, the, the throne. They thought he was legitimate king. They liked the fact that he brought in building projects. They liked the fact that he brought, built the temple, re, had rebuilt the temple. Uh, so a lot of folks liked Herod. And if, if the thought of a new Messiah coming around probably upset some of the people, thinking, uh-oh, this is another Messiah attempt, and he's going he's gonna to mess things up for us. Okay, so if you're listening, here's the question number three. Why was Herod troubled why was he upset at hearing the birth of jesus because he thought he was going to make him the third throne very good very good and herod's mind he thought jesus was going to be another political king another political rival that was going to try to steal his throne from him steal his position of power and so just like he had three sons murdered he thought well killing this little boy would get rid of him as being a threat right well here's the next question so this might be a little tougher question why was all, now that's a, a, an exaggeration, right? But the point is, why was all of Jerusalem troubled? Why, why the phrase that is other folks in Jerusalem troubled at the thought of Jesus being born? Um, okay. I, I kind of said that pretty fast a minute ago. Because a lot of folks in Jerusalem really, really liked Herod's leadership. He wasn't, a, he wasn't a morally virtuous guy, but he did get them the temple rebuilt. He did have other building projects. Uh, going on, and he was a popular king to some degree, a very powerful guy, so some folks like Herod in power. So that's probably some of the explanation. Karth, go ahead and get verse 4 for us. And for assembling all the... You don't have to read the numbers, or just verses. Just skip the number. Oh. And assembling all the chief... And assembling all the chief priests, priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judah, for so it is written by the prophet. Very good. Now those are some tough words, right? You don't normally read Judea and uh, assembling, but you did a pretty good job with that. Thank you, Kara, and just pushing on with that. So let's take a look at some characters. As we go through this, we'll stop along the way and make some comments about these characters we're going to meet. Who are the scribes? Well, from the exile from 586 B.C., which is the time that, that Jerusalem was sacked and they were carted off to Babylon for captivity, all the way through that period of time, all the way to 70 A.D., which is the destruction of the temple, these folks named the scribes were the writers. They were clerks. They copied scriptures. They were le the legal experts. Sometimes they're called lawyers in, the, in, the, in some English translations. But they would draft legal documents like marriage certificates, divorce certificates, loans, inheritance, paperwork, that kind of stuff. So these scribes knew the scriptures. That's why Herod calls the scribes in. He calls these professionals in to say, look, the wise men have arrived. They say that they have seen the star where the, where the Messiah is to be born. We don't know where they're going. And so they asked the, the, the Bible experts, right? And the scribes will say, look, uh, the, the Bible says Bethlehem. That's where I start my search. That's what they say. Okay. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd.
shepherd my people Israel. Very good. Thank you so much. Now, if you can see the screen, I went ahead and finished up the entire quote of Micah. Matthew stops with the first half of, of the verse 2 in Micah 5. I went ahead and finished up because I think it's, it's rich theologically there. And the rest of the verse would say, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. That's the rest of the, of the verse there in Micah 5, 2, which is a reference to the eternal God, the eternal God coming into time and space, whose whose origins don't begin in Bethlehem. They don't begin uh, in the uterus of a teenage girl in Bethlehem. They begin not in a natural means, but they are from old, eternity, right? From ancient of days. So the prophecy of Micah is really, uh, I mean, Matthew doesn't give all of that, but I want you to know that it's, read the rest of that prophecy, the rest of, my, of, of Micah's thoughts. It's a reference to the eternal God. Well, the next, next detail I want to point out in the text here is Bethlehem. Bethlehem was a small village. It wasn't a town. It was a little village, a little farming village, a little shepherding village, about six miles from Jerusalem. You can get a map, a good Bible map. You can see it's about six miles south or so of Jerusalem. It was a village that was so small that the nation, whenever they went to war, would not bother recruiting soldiers from Bethlehem. That's how small Bethlehem was. They didn't have anything of value in Bethlehem. They didn't recruit their men to fight in battles because it was such a tiny a village of maybe 300 people. That's how small it was. So that's why they didn't bother with a lot of uh, recruiting of soldiers from Bethlehem. That's what I've heard. Well, I'm going to show you a map. So I'm going to pull back a little bit here. You get a chance to see the whole Middle East. You can see, uh, if you can see the map, the map that would have uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Egyptian, uh, the Nile Basin, uh, northern uh, parts of Egypt across there, the Sinai Peninsula. But if you look at this map here, I really want to step back a little bit and show you where or Persia was, which is modern-day Iran. This is where the wise men came from. We know that the Magi uh, were from the east, most likely from Persia, or as I said a moment ago, which is called today modern-day Iran. So that kind of gives you an idea of where they were geographically. The star on the map is kind of small. That's Jerusalem. And you can, see, you can see the Promised Land there. You can see Palestine. You can see Israel, whatever you want to call the land there. And then far to the east of that, you see way over here in Persia, I got a circle around that area. It's kind of it's part of the land. So this means that the wise men traveled anywhere as, as, as near as 800 miles to as far as 1,300 miles to see the Christ child. And if they're on foot, you can do the math. 20 miles a day, you can figure out the math the days it would take them to walk it, at that pace. Camel a lot faster by camel. We don't know for sure how long it took them, how far they walked, but we pretty much can guess, uh, estimate they came from modern-day Iran or which would have been ancient Persia. And that's a good map. So I'm going to leave that map and continue on here. Most like, likely the Magi knew of the writings of the prophet Daniel, who in the time past had been the chief of the court seers in Persia. Daniel, if you look, look back in Daniel chapter 9, uh, which is written 600 years before the birth of Christ, includes a prophecy which gives a timeline for the birth of the Messiah. And it says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to finish a transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness. So when Daniel prophesied the coming Messiah, when he was way back in captivity in Persia, way back in the Babylonian captivity, he had prophesied that the Messiah would be born, who wouldn't just be a political leader, but he would be someone who would atone for sin and bring everlasting righteousness. This is 600 years before the birth of Christ. It's a long time before that. So he predicts the ministry and the date of the coming Messiah. And I'll continue a little bit more here. The Magi may have been aware of the prophecy of Balaam. So you've got two sources of, of inspiration. You've got either Balaam from the book of Numbers, or you've got Daniel from the, the book of Daniel, the prophecy. Balaam is from the town of, of Pethor in the, on the Euphrates River, which is near Persia. And you find this in Numbers 24, says this. Balaam's prophecy says specifically, mentions a star coming out of Jacob. And that's, that's where most scholars think that this is probably something from, uh, from Balaam. And he, here's the prophecy. He says, I see him, but not now. Behold, I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter, uh, a rod, a staff, shall come out of Israel. Now, if you're familiar with Hebrew poetry, what we see here is a par it's, it's called parallelism, a Hebrew parallelism, which is where you say one thing and then you rephrase it and say the same, the same in meaning, but you say it differently. And you see, a, you see a parallelism here. Easy for me to say, right? Parallelism, that's a hard word to say. Hebrew parallelism. Uh, Jacob and Israel, the same person. Jacob is Israel. 
His name was changed to Israel. And a star and a rod represent the same thing here. So it's a Hebrew parallel poetry here. It's, it's prophetic poetry uh, that he sees coming uh, out of Jacob, out of the land of Israel. Same thing. A scepter or star to be born. A king, right, who would be reigning. So back to the text. Matthew 7 and 8. Then Herod... Herod. Then Herod summoned the wise men sec secretly and ascertained. Asked, okay, I was never going to. That's an ascertained. That's a tough one. Ascertained. Ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, "Go and search diligently, diligently for the child." And when you have found him, bring me word that I, too, may come and worship him. Very good. Thank you, Cara. Tough words. You did a great job with that. So, Herod talks to the wise men, and he wants to ascertain or figure out. He wants to deduce, figure this out. What time the star appeared in the sky? Because he's going to start dating the birth of, of the Jesus on the, the date of the star appearing. Go and search for the child. When you found him, bring him to me. That can they worship him. Now, here's the question number five. Is why did Herod want to find Jesus? What do you think, Cara Jean? Either to worship him. Well, that's what he says, right? Or to, like, kill him. Or to kill him, that's right. So, if your worship takes the form of killing someone, then they mean the same thing. But <laughs> he says to them, I want to worship this baby like you do. But we've read the story in the Gospel of Matthew. We know he doesn't want to worship Jesus. He wants to kill him. Because if he can kill him, then there's no threat to his throne. Ooh. Well, that's, I told you that we'd get to Herod the Great. And I want to show you some information about Herod the Great before going further. Herod the Great reigned as king for 36 years. It's longer than he's been alive, Carl. About many, many years, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. About decades. Uh, the reviled and feared Jewish regional ruler of the, of the Jews was allowed to reign by the Romans. He'd made a deal with the Romans. They let him have the position of power and the title of king. But he was a man who was feared. While some liked his, his, what he was doing politically, many folks feared him because he was, he was ruthless. Like many despots, Herod considered himself to be a builder of great cities and, and magnificent structures. He continued the work on the fortress of Masada and rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem on a grand scale. It worked that went on for decades, which was not completed until even after his death. I think the, the temple in Jerusalem was, I think it was finished being built within 10 years before it was destroyed. So all those decades being built, he never saw it finished because it was always, uh, always being built. You know, it was always sound, I think they said that the sound of the hammer never stopped uh, the building of the temple until it was finished. So they were around the clock all the time, inlaying gold, um, marble pillars, all the things you'd put on the temple. Herod, and, and he did that to, to get favor with the people because if you give people their temple or bu bu building projects, they're going to keep you in power. Be like with, they're going to like your power. That would be annoying to hear a hammer all the time. It would be, man, living next door to the temple, knock, 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 knock. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's maybe a bit of an exaggeration, but the idea was that it's, it's constant work for those decades because it was a magnificent structure, which only stood for a short time before it was eventually destroyed. But like many politicians today, uh, I'm not getting political on this, but I'll just say it's, it's, it's without, without a doubt, um, they, they'll do building projects, and they'll do things for the people who elect them, uh, not just because it needs to be built, right, but because it, it makes them popular. And so this is, I think that's probably Herod's motivation there. And a few more bullet points before we get off Herod. But he was a paranoid ruler. I mentioned earlier, had three of his sons murdered to ensure his power. So when they ever got to be teenagers, he made sure they didn't lift to adulthood because he would wipe them out. He killed his brother-in-law, who was a threat to his throne. Um, he even killed his beloved wife. Yep. And now, this is, this is odd. I heard this, and I, I'm going to assume it to be true, that he kept, her, um, he kept her body. He regretted having her killed and was remorseful that he, she, was, she was killed. And kept her like uh, in a in a container in his bedroom uh, and uh, pickled her or in in uh, in fluids of some sorts. Uh, I know that's pretty gross, isn't it? Kept her body. I know it's, this is R-rated stuff. Hard to imagine. Uh, and you can check that out historically if you want to. 
He had her killed. He loved her, but he had regrets. Of course, once he had her killed, it was no, no turning back. Ruthless guy. He died of a, of a, of a painful and chronic kidney disease. I'm glad I he, yeah, he ordered the execution of most of his uh, most uh, beloved Jewish teachers upon his death. So they'd be mourning in all the land. So he said, this is interesting. So he knew that many folks, many folks didn't like him. They feared him, didn't like him, right? And he said, when I die, I want there to be great weeping and wailing and crying in all of Jerusalem. So he had ordered the most popular Jewish teachers in town to be killed on the day that he died so people would cry. Now that is, that's a despot, isn't it? Can you imagine that? I just want to say, what kind of king is that? Right? He's a tyrant. Uh, so that's, that's a good question. So let's get to the next question. That's a good statement. Let's get to the next question. Question six. What kind of ruler was Herod? Margie, what kind of ruler was he? Yeah, what, 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 what kind of king was he? What, what do people think of? What kind of person was he? A bad person. A, that's right, a bad person. <laughs> Maybe even better to phrase it, what kind of person was Herod? He was a bad person, wasn't he? What kind of emotional connotation might be... Uh, might be with the phrase in the days of Herod in the mind of the re readers of the gospel. So what, what when you heard the phrase in the days of Herod, what, what might a person feel or experience emotionally when they heard the phrase in the days of Herod the Great? What do you think folks would feel when they heard that phrase in the days of Herod the Great? They would feel like bad because all those people were killed during the days that Herod was king. Yeah. I think the majority of folks probably shuddered when they thought the days that he ruled 36 years. They probably shuddered when they thought, oh my goodness, this is not a guy that we liked. It was a bad time in our nation's history. Now, there were folks who liked him for sure, but that, that might conjure up those kinds of ideas. We'll continue on here. Verses 9 through 12. Go for it. Oh, wow. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to residence over the place where the child was when wait when the child was where the child was that's right oh where the child was when they saw the star they rejoiced ex exceedingly exceedingly with great joy and going into the house they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. They then opening the their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. 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 Very good. Very good. Myrrh. We just heard this on the Christmas program not long ago: gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Jerry. Got this little friend of ours here. Oh, Tristan and Dad. So let's look at the gifts of the Magi here. The gifts of the Magi. We have three gifts. And so people think because there's this is truly live TV, isn't it? There's no editing. Come here, baby. We have three gifts. And so many people think because there's three gifts, there's gotta be three people. And that's not not the case. There's at least Magi's plural. There's at least two people. Probably there are dozens of people. There's a, a caravan, a camel caravan, like a Dodge caravan, a camel caravan of people coming from the east. So it wasn't, probably wasn't three people. They were, you know, they were multiple people on this trip. There are three gifts, and these gifts have, have a meaning to it, historical meaning to this. Gold is a gift you give a king because gold is a precious metal. It's a very valuable. Gold is a gift of a king. Frankincense is sometimes used in worship which shows that people would, would worship Jesus. So frankincense is an incense that would be burned in, in worship. It would be a, a fragrant perfume or an incense burned at worship. And then myrrh is a perfume put on dead bodies that show that Jesus would suffer and die. I know, it's a, what a strange gift gifts to give to, a, to a, an infant, right? Gold, he's not a king. In the eyes of the world, he's not a king. He's just a baby in, in, a, in a cattle trough, isn't he? The gold, the gift of a king, frankincense, uh, a very expensive uh, perfume, an uh, ointment of some thing that would be, could be burned or used for worship that way. And then myrrh, which in those days, uh, before the, the modern ways of, of uh, keeping a body preserved, you'd wrap it in the, in the cloth, 
and you would put myrrh on it to keep the odor down, you put it in a tomb. So myrrh. Now these three gifts show that this is not an ordinary baby. He's a king, he's worthy of worship, and he's come to die. So this is Jesus' baby shower, so to speak. They shower him with gifts. Uh, and not, not once they mention uh, chew toys or, or onesies or diapers, right? These are the gifts to give Jesus. And we'll move on here. And being born in a dream, not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Very good. Now, it doesn't say specifically how they were, uh, how, I mean, they were warned in a dream, so it took place when they were asleep. But was it God speaking through the dream? Was it another angelic visitor? We don't have the details of how God communicated in the dream. Uh, it was something they saw, something they heard. But the point is, they knew for sure that this was a supernatural warning not to go back north to Jerusalem, but to bypass, circumnavigate, go around Jerusalem, and then back to, uh, back to their homeland back in Persia. So I'll give you some brief commentary here. Uh, note that the Magi arrive around two years after the birth of Jesus. So this is not the Christmas story of the Gospel of Luke. In the Gospel of Luke, we get the Christmas story at the moment he comes into the world and is wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in a manger. We get that moment. We get the angel, We get the shepherds and the angels on the hillside. We get all of that story. The reason why you don't get those details in Matthew because this is a different version. This takes place up to two years after the first Christmas night. And here's some cues from the text, which I put on the screen earlier. The family is living in a house, not, not in a structure where animals are kept, right? They're living in a house at the time the wise men arrive. Jesus is not called an infant. He's not a baby. In fact, the word they use for Jesus is a child, which is a toddler. And then lastly, we know earlier in the verses that Herod calculates the age based on the Magi's testimony when the star first appeared, which would have been his birth star, right, whatever the sign was, and this calculates how old the wise men, how the child would have been. Any comments, Tristan? He says, no, we're going to move on here. Uh, some more uh, some more commentary. It says, it's common misconception that the wise men visited Jesus at the stable on the night of his birth. In fact, the wise men came days, months, or possibly even years later. That's why Matthew 2.11 says, the wise men visited and worshipped Jesus can you help me, Tristan, there? Visited Jesus in a house and not in a stable. So, if you have a nativity set at home, you put it on your TV set or on your mantle at Christmas time. Tristan, can help us out there. Come here, Dipsy. No, Mama help us with that. Come here, Dipsy. That's my cat. Sorry. She's looking for me because I came upstairs. All right. So if you, if you put on a nativity set on your mantle or your TV or somewhere display that on your table at home during the Christmas season, uh, you might want to put the wise men across the room or down the hall, somewhere else in the house, so they're not anywhere near the nativity where you have the wise men, you have, excuse me, we have the shepherds and Joseph and Mary. You want to put that somewhere across from your house. Or maybe you could change it around, be creative, right? And, and the first half of the month you, you have the Christmas store and then you move the wise men out. Or the shepherds out in the wise. I don't know. You could do it. But don't have them together because they weren't there together is the point of, of, of saying that. Okay. Verses 13 through 15. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Very good, very good. This is the second dream, the second dream visit that Joseph has from an angel or messenger of God. God can communicate through dreams, but does not guarantee that he will for every believer. So if you go tonight and have, go to bed tonight and dream that God's visited you, it could be God or it could be, you know, it could be Taco Salad. <laughs> Um, the scripture is our ultimate authority when it comes to receiving information from God. It is the most objective truth that is not, uh, it's not tainted by our, our preconceptions. Uh, so while the scriptures do show that God appeared to people in dreams, uh, just ha weigh that with a grain of salt, you know, as I say. So, you know, weigh it in the, in the revealed scriptures. So, wise men get the word. You know the Christmas story. Uh, they go off to back home without going to, to Jerusalem. And, the, uh, and now Joseph gets the same kind of a dream, and he the, has the same kind of warning. It's not to, to go to Persia, it's to go south to Egypt, to get out of the land, out of Herod's reach. Okay. 
And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed 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 to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Very good. Now Matthew, Matthew will quote prophecy again and again and again. He'll quote the Old Testament scriptures because that's what he does. He wants to show that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies, uh, speaking that he would come into the world. Now, he's quoting Hosea here. And the prophecy has two explanations. Either it refers to Jesus' childhood being called out of Egypt, Hosea's prophecy, or when Hosea wrote it, it referred to uh, Moses and the children of Israel being called out of Egypt. Right? That's, you know... God's children are, you know, called out of Egypt. But I think it's both. I think when Hosea had written this, it was, it's past tense. He's referencing the love of God for his, his people, calling them out of Egypt. But Matthew will take this and apply it not just historically to the people of Israel, but he's going to apply it now at the moment of the Christmas story, the Christmas stories, and show this is God calling Jesus out of Egypt. So this is interesting how, how that works. Okay, so question seven, you've been listening. In what ways did God call his son out of Egypt? What two ways? In a dream? Sure. So he, he used a dream to do that. How does he call Jesus out of Egypt, his son? Or how does he call his son out of Egypt? How does God call his son out of Egypt? Um, in a dream and... That's a little tricky, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he does it in two ways. He either does it through... Jesus, who was a child, went to Egypt and stayed until the death of Herod, and calls him out that way. Or he does it to the nation of Israel, who will be in bondage and kept him for 400 years, and then will call them out. Those are two ways that he calls his people out of Egypt. So here we see the life of Jesus par that parallels the Exodus account. Uh, they go into Egypt for 400 years. Jesus goes there for a few years, and then they both get called out of Egypt. Verses 16 through 18. Okay, here we go. The Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years older or under, according to them, according to the time that he had ascertained ascertained from the wise men. Very good. Herod orders the infanticide of children up to two years of age just to maintain his career. He sees this child potentially a threat and uh, orders their death. Now, if you wonder why this doesn't make headlines in, in, the, in its day or it does not make a uh, bold uh, splash across history because uh, Bethlehem is so small. A village of maybe 300 people. you got to figure... Uh, how many male sons would have been born there? I mean, a, a dozen maximum, you know, three or four probably. So it was in the scheme of infanticide, killing, senseless killing infants, and uh, you know, infants, it, it's a pretty small scope. But it's, a, it, it's a very important if you're the mother of the family of that child that's killed for sure. Well, what does this tell you about Herod? That Con? he's a very mean and selfish man, and he really doesn't care about anybody else. Alpha number one, isn't he? Out for number one. Out for himself. Only out to look after his own self. Not nobody else. Right? Verse 17. Okay. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jer Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ra Rama, Rama mm -hmm. weeping in loud Lamentation. Lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Very good. Now, Rachel, if you know this Rachel, she's the wife of Jacob. She's the wife of Israel. She's the national mother of Israel. And Israel's, you know, from, from Jacob, his name is also Israel, comes the 12 sons, who are the 12 tribes. So there's a sense in which Rachel is the mother of the 12 tribes of Israel. She's weeping. Uh, for, you know, the mother of the nation is weeping for the children. But well, why do you think that Matthew includes so much fulfilled prophecy? May I have a guess why that might be? 
Why does Matthew have so many fulfilled prophecies? We've seen Isaiah, we've seen Daniel, we've seen Hosea. All these references, these scriptures have been fulfilled. Anybody have any, any guesses on that? Because he was Jewish. Because he was Jewish. Very he wanted good. to make sure he, the Jewish people realized that they could put the two together. And he's writing to a Jewish audience. He's writing to a Jewish audience, and he wants to make sure the Jewish audience knows this is he is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Well, Michelle, instead of just being the voice behind the camera, come in here and say hi. No, yeah. I'm not going to say hi, but that's She's, your answer. <laughs> she has her pajamas on. She doesn't want to get in front of the camera, but and that's right. she has right. no makeup. Yeah, that's beside the point. So, what was Matthew? He was his audience. Mother Show gave the right answer. He's a Jewish man. He's Levi writing to a Jewish audience, a Jewish Christian audience. Well, very good. Well, let's continue on. And if, if there's any comments, Tristan, you let us know. It's okay. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child. And his mother, and to go to the land of Israel, Israel. for those who sought, sought, mm -hmm. sought the children's life are dead. And he rose and took the child, child, and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. Very good, very good. So, <clears throat> the the message is to wait until Herod dies. And then when Herod dies, uh, they're safely to be able to go back to, uh, back to the land of Galilee, back to the back of the land. Now Herod is thought to have died around 1 BC. So most scho uh, many scholars think there's no there's never 100 percent consensus, but many scholars think that Herod died around about around the year 1 BC. And they think, well, how does he die one year before Christ? Well, Jesus was born 3 BC. <laughs> that doesn't mean he was born three years before he was born. It just means the way that we calculate time is that he was born three years before we, we think that being his, his, his date of his birth now. So Herod died when he was about two or so. So their time in Egypt wasn't very, wasn't very long. Verse 22. But when he heard that Archelaus, Archelaus. Archelaus was reigning. Raining. That's a word. It's raining. It's a weird word. Yeah, that is weird. Reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to district of Galilee. Very good. If you can see the map, I have the successors of King Herod on the map on the screen. We and those are the territories. Uh, we have uh, Herod Archelaus, which was which we would have been taking Herod the Great. He had his son. So when Herod dies. His four sons that were living and his sister uh, take over ruling the land that he would have had when he was living. So his son Archelaus gets the, gets the province of Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. That's all the area around Jerusalem there. And then the other parts, go, uh, we'll look at this on the next screen here. And so Herod was born in 74 B.C. He dies about 1 B.C. Christ is about two years old. So Herod Archelaus, he... Um, it's, the, it's, it's counting time backwards, isn't it? <laughs> Herod Archelaus has Judea, Samaria, Judea. Herod Antipas has Galilee and Perea. And Salome, Herod's sister, has the Mediterranean coast in the west of Galilee. And Philip has the northeast of the Jordan River, which is what we call the Decapolis. So there are four, three sons and then his sister. They divide the land up after his death. And that's just interesting. So if you can see the color-coded map, tells you the idea of where everybody was ruling after Herod died. And so, when Herod is dead, it's now safe to go back into back into the promised land, so to speak. So out of Egypt they go, and he, they don't go back to Bethlehem, because that wasn't their home city. They go to Nazareth. They go to a different area. Verse 23. And, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. So that was... So that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. Nazarene, that's right. So why did the family return to the region of Galilee? Why did the family go back to Galilee? Why did they go back to Nazareth? Any, any guesses there? Because... Well, that's kind of two reasons, right? Herod the Great's dead, so it's safe to go back. And
Okay. And that where was where they jo- were from. That's right. Joseph and Mary's hometown was yeah. in the north in Galilee. That's what they knew. Yeah. That was where they were from. That was where all their kinfolk lived. Oh. That was all their hometown. They're familiar with that. He had a business to go back to, so it was it was kind of familiar ground, wasn't it? Okay. Let's, I'm gonna read some commentary. So the Nazarene, the term Nestor rendered branch in Isaiah 11:1. 1. It's thus suggested that that Nazareth may have derived its name from the root form of of Nasar. It's alleged then that a that a word play is employed here, which is a common device both in Jewish and Greek literature, that implies a connection between the messianic prophecy in Isaiah. And the uh, the nickname, the appellation nickname given to Jesus, he's the Nazarene. So supposedly, branch would suggest an insignificant beginning, which would correspond with the humble uh, environs of, of of the community of Nazareth, in which the Lord grew up. The Lord Himself, in His conversation with Saul on the road to Damascus, identifies Jesus as being of Nazareth. So Jesus was a Nazarene. In fact, if you if you remember the stories of the of the crucifixion of Jesus, around the campfire, Peter gets outed twice for his Galilean accent, which is the same area. So he has this kind of this hick accent, this farming, fishing accent, community accent. That's kind of outsome. So these people are, are Galileans from the north. Oh, no, that's weird. All right. Read Isaiah 53, if you would. Okay. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been released? Revealed. 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 Sorry. That's well, okay. Keep going on. You did a good job. <laughs> For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was this and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted, acquainted. acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and went esteemed him not. And we esteemed him not. Very good. So I have a map there beside it. This is the region of Galilee, and the star in the center of the screen just about there is Nazareth. And that's the town he grew up in, another small town there where he grew up. Uh, and that's this Jesus' hometown, his home area. From, so from the time he gets back when he's about two, three years old, until the time he begins public ministry at about 30 years old, he spends all those years in Nazareth. We have, we have no childhood stories from Nazareth. We have, we've got one childhood story, and he's 12 years old, and it's a Jerusalem story. But he's on vacation. He's out of town. It's a vacation story. And he's in, he's in Jerusalem. So we don't get any childhood stories from the Gospels about Jesus' early years, adolescent years, young adulthood. In the Gnostic Gospels, we get a couple of those, which those aren't actual stories. They're just sort of made up long after the fact. Um, but we don't get any of those childhood stories from Jesus. We don't know about his uh, who he sat beside in fourth grade English class. We don't know about him making the softball team. We don't know any of the stories of Jesus. It's just childhood <laughs> stuff. Uh, he lived like we did. But I'd notice, say it was because it was a common childhood. Yeah, nothing, nothing spectacular. Out of the ordinary. Yeah, right. nothing to report. Pretty common man. In fact, one of the, one of the, one of the criticisms of Jesus will be, uh, isn't this Joseph's son, the son of a carpenter? We know his parents. So there's nothing about his childhood is, is remarkable uh, in that, that aspect at all. Very good. Uh, the prophet Isaiah here in Isaiah 53, this is a messianic prophecy, tells us something we don't often think about Jesus. He was not attractive. Nothing about his physical appearance would have drawn you to him. Uh, I think comely is a word that the King James uses, a very attractive kind of a, an appearance. When we cast these Jesus of Nazareth movies, these Jesus movies, we often pick these guys that are very attractive, and that's, that should be a criticism. Uh, and sometimes th- that takes you out of the story because Jesus, uh, historically speaking, according to Isaiah, predicting this, uh, wasn't a, an incredibly attractive physical form, right? It wasn't something that would have been like, ah. Anyway, that's a neat, neat idea. Let's get to the last slide here. And the question is, how is Jesus like a tender shoot springing up? How is he the root of Jesse? That's a tough question for you. Yeah. He's a tender shoot. Fragile. The prophet Isaiah indicates his very humble beginnings, a tender shoot. He wasn't born in the palace. He wasn't fed with the, uh, with a silver spoon in his mouth. He didn't grow up with the, what, with the, with the clothes of the royal garb of the men of his, uh, kings of his day. Very humble beginnings. 
uh, like a little tender plant growing up in your garden, right? Uh, so it's modest beginnings. It's nice. I, I guess it'd be nice. <laughs> There's nothing about I don't it. Know. I mean, you think me modesty goes with this? He's nothing about him says royalty. Other, but it's it's ironic because the wise men they come to find a king, and the the, the king they find is a, probably a toddler. And he's not in a fancy palace. He's in a very humble home, isn't he? He's a root of Jesse. He's come from the line of Jesse all the way through David, the royal line of the kings. And this, this child has his rightful heir to the throne. And he will take the throne someday. In fact, he's in, ruling and reigning even now in heaven after he ascended to the Father. So, interesting. We appreciate you guys tuning in. It was a very wild night, wasn't it? We had a visitor come into the room and meow at us a couple of times. We, had a, uh, we turned the camera early on, didn't we? <laughs> Uh, we've had all kinds of fun stuff happen. This is live, isn't it, Carji? Yeah. Actually, this is pretty calm for our house. Yeah. Up here, this is. Pretty we're trying to keep the chaos down. Any yeah. comment, Trish, as we close out this evening? Any, anything people jumped in to say? Mmm. And Carr's got a couple of compliments about oh. her reading. Yeah. Well, who gave Car? Who gave Car the shout out? Probably Memo. Uh, yep, Memo, Frank, and Carol Crease. And Grandma, and Granddad. Um, can't see the uh, older ones, but yeah. Okay, very good. So, we thank you for joining us tonight. We've had all sorts of guests, guest hosts tonight, haven't we? Our, over time. So, thank you guys for tuning in. Next week, Gospel of Matthew will be in part four, chapter three. We're moving right through the Gospel of Matthew. Join us Sunday morning. We'll have a pre recorded service. We plan to. And we'll post that Facebook live, and then we'll have a Sunday evening. We'll have a, a live service also Sunday evening. So, Tune in those times. Uh, if you have prayer concerns, let us know about those. And we will close out in prayer. You want to close out in prayer? Um, or am I should close out? I should close out in prayer. Yeah. Let's pray then. <laughs> Father, we thank you for allowing us to come and study your word tonight. We thank you that uh, you sent your son, very humble beginnings, to enter time and space. Um, he, didn't, he didn't come just to give his life for a certain social class of people. But Father, he came to give himself for those who are sinners. And Father, remind us uh, every day that we are sinners in need of your grace. We thank you for the gift of Christ, that first, most precious Christmas gift. We ask you to be with those who are suffering with this virus that's uh, affected all of our lives. Those who've lost lives, we pray that you be with their families. We pray that you be with those uh, who've lost jobs in this time period. We pray, Father, that you be with those in a very special way who have needs. Uh, and, and lastly, Father, be with us, strengthen us uh, through, uh, through the rest of this week. We come back in your house of worship. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.